All right, guys, so we're going to talk about ocean acidification today. And we did our closed reading on coral bleaching, All right? So coral bleaching and ocean acidification are similar, and a lot of kids get uh, them too mixed up, but they are very different. They're caused for ultimately the same reason. So I wanted to remind you what coral bleaching was. Um, what reef were they talking about in the closed reading? The Great Barrier, the Great Barrier Reef. What's so, so important about that? It is. It's the world's largest reef. And where is it located? Come on, somebody else. Australia, right? It's pretty obvious. All right, so what's the biggest idea that's from this article? Like, what are we getting out of it? Pretty much we have to stop polluting or um, it's going to be permanently damaged. Yeah. The reefs are at a point now where we've almost reached too far gone. There isn't a whole lot we can do from this point on to save the reefs that are already in peril. There's not. If you haven't seen a coral reef, you need to go see one because in the next 20 years, they will be gone. Your children will probably not be able, will see the end of the coral reef ecosystem. And when the coral reef ecosystem collapses, that's gonna be a huge impact on the world. It's going to happen, unfortunately, at this point. There isn't a whole lot we can do about it now. We've kind of reached, we went way past that stopping point, but we can slow that down. So there's a difference between stopping it, which isn't any more possible, and slowing the progression of this actually happening. And one of the ways to do that is to stop putting these greenhouse gases in the air. All right, but the second issue with the reef, it's not just those um, coral bleaching. Yeah, what you got? I can't hear you. How is that going to be bad for the world? All right, so when we talked about our last lecture, the issues with losing the coral reef. Number one, every coastline city in the world depends on seafood production. The coral reef is almost like the, um, the rainforest of the ocean. And so without the coral reefs, all of those animals have nowhere to live. They are increased predation, so they all go away. Those are our food source. I love shrimp. You probably like shrimp too. If you like shrimp or seafood, you better be really careful about taking all this pollution to the ocean. And everything, just like Nemo says, everything leads to the ocean. It really does. So no more sushi. No more sushi. I know, right? That's the worst part. No more shrimp. Poor things, they're tasty. All right, but the second punch, so it's a one-two punch to them. The second punch is ocean acidification. So not only are we having these warmer temperatures, which are expelling the zooanthellae, which are causing them to bleach and die eventually of starvation, we're also killing them because the ocean itself is becoming more acidic. And that's what this lecture is on. Pretty much, sadly. All right, so what we wind up having is the... What is ocean acidification? So ocean acidification is the second issue, and it's basically a decrease in pH. You've probably heard about pH before when we're talking about acids and bases and things like that, right? Okay, what's happening is when you lower the pH, you're causing it to become more acidic. And that's what's happening to our oceans. And we're going to talk about why that happens. And there's a little bit of chemistry in this section that you do have to understand. We're going to break it down as easy as we can, but you do have to understand a little bit of chem for it. All right, so an estimated 30 to 40% of the carbon dioxide that we release. Well, every time I talk, I release carbon dioxide, right? Um, carbon dioxide is also given off every single time you use any sort of energy, which means you turn on your phone, you turn on the lights, you, you know, have an air conditioner, you run your car. Any of that stuff is giving off carbon dioxide as well. And what are we doing to the plants that usually use that carbon dioxide to give us oxygen? What have we done to them all? We killed them. Look outside. We are mostly pavement people, right? We have taken down all the trees. We've taken down all the grass. We've taken away huge acreages, I mean, massive amounts of trees. So this conversion in the world that normally stays balanced between production of carbon dioxide and the use of carbon dioxide and by plants is completely off. And so we wound up really, really screwing ourselves on this one. And so 
what we do is the ocean is a large sink. Do you know what I mean when I say sink for carbon dioxide? So what a sink is, is an area that absorbs it. So the ocean is a huge area that absorbs all this carbon dioxide. But when it absorbs it, carbon dioxide is a gas, right? I'm giving it off now, right? That's carbon dioxide mostly. <laughs> yeah, I, all right, but when you give off carbon dioxide, it's a gas. It gets dissolved in a liquid. You know this because you drink carbon dioxide gas. Those are carbonated drinks, like all the Coke and Sprite and all those, all the fizzy bubbles. Those are carbon dioxide bubbles. All right, so what happens is when the gas goes into a liquid, it turns it into what's called carbonic acid. That's why soda, and you know it, eats teeth and things like that, right? Because it's acidic, highly acidic. And it's acidic because of the carbon dioxide. When it dissolves, it turns into carbonic acid. All right? So these extra carbonic acid molecules react with the water. And they make this, con uh, they make this uh, bicarbonate ion and a hydronium ion. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, but listen, bicarbonate is very active. It starts to uh, react with things in the ocean. The hydronium ion, that's what we're measuring when we measure pH. It just means a hydrogen, a free hydrogen. All right, so it increases the amount of hydrogen present in the water, which turns it into more of an acid, just by nature. All right, so what's happened is between, for the last 200 years, since we have had um, the Industrial Revolution, when we started burning fossil fuels by the gallons or busload, what happened is the, um, it's increased the ocean's acidity about 30% already. We have measurements pre-industrial revolution of the pH of the ocean. We know that about 1800 is where it started. So before then, we know what the ocean's pH was. And it was pretty steady at about 8.1 or 8.2, 8.2, not 8.1. And what's happened is it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. And right now we're currently at 8.1 and below. So what we're doing is we're lowering the pH. You literally have lowered the pH of the entire ocean, literally every ocean. That's a massive amount of water. And we've already dropped it at logarithmic fold. So this pH scale is logarithmic, which means huge. They're dropped by powers of 10. So we've already dropped it by a power of 10, which is about 30% more acidic already. And we're going up, 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 up since then. We're not stopping. All right, so this can be a huge issue. And so what's going to happen is the oxygen um, in the, I'm sorry, the carbon dioxide is going to get absorbed into that ocean, okay? But the amount it can absorb depends. You know this because you've all drank Coke. If I have hot Coke sitting out on the counter, is it gonna be more flat or less fat, flat than a cold one? It's gonna be flat, right? Temperature affects the amount of carbon dioxide that's in there. When you're flat, you've got less carbon dioxide. You know that, that's why it's gross. All right, so temperature has an effect, also pressure, right? That's why when I open the lid, what happens to all the gases? They go, and they go out, right? So it lowers the amount, so pressure, increased pressure, and that's important because at the bottom of the ocean, you know there's a lot more pressure, right? All right, so salinity also has an effect on it. Coke isn't super salty. It does have some, but it wouldn't make any sense. But the salinity also changes the amount that it can absorb. So it differs wherever you are in the ocean. Like if you're at the bottom of the ocean with high pressures or high salinities, it depends, right? So the amount of gas goes down as temperature or salinity goes up. 
And so salinity is just how much salt there is. We talked about that before. So if you increase temperature and you increase salinity, you decrease the amount of carbon dioxide that can go in there. All right, so this is the carbon cycle. This is what our world is based off of, ideally, minus us trying to destroy it because we're humans and we do that. All right, so the carbon is what is coming off of things. So we usually put gases in the air. One of the biggest culprit is the energy sector. Large gas plumes, large carbon dioxide burning causes a massive amount of carbon dioxide to be released along with other things that are bad for our environment. And so we use burning coal plants to produce lights, power plugs, Tri-County Electric is a coal burning facilities. Duke Energy has a hydroelectric plant that's very small, but it is on the Swanee right there off of 90. You can't really see it. But if you've ever went fishing on the Swanee, you might have seen it. There's a hydroelectric plant here. It's not very big. It doesn't produce all of it. They also use coal burning as well. There is a nuclear energy power plant off the coastline off of um, south of here just a little bit um but the problem with it is it's getting decommissioned because it's old at this point i mean they all have that chance but they're rare all right so this every time you use power every time you're putting off carbon dioxide all right so this carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere and about 30 percent of it actually gets absorbed into the sea and what happens is when that's absorbed the zooplankton interact with the carbon dioxide. Remember, the zooplankton is the plankton that are like animal-like. You have phytoplankton that are using that carbon dioxide. Carbon sinks to the depths. It's incorporated into rocks. It becomes oil that we pump back up to the surface, burn it, and the cycle starts all over again, right? That is the fossil fuel cycle, and it's kind of destructive. All right, so if we don't have water, we can't produce any life, right? We know this, this basic concept that you understand since you were little. You got to have water or you don't survive. Wow. Why? Because water is what makes all of your cellular membranes work. And if you don't have a cellular membrane, then nothing can get into or out of any of your cells. And that is, by essence, cellular death. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You've got to have water, and you have to have those electrolytes that can go through that membrane. It has to be in an aqueous environment. That's why you have blood. All biochemical reactions, except for a very small few, require water. All of them. So if you don't have water, you cannot do anything. Your body can't. You could eat all you wanted, but it's not going to be able to process that food without water. Mm -hmm. That's why you die fast without water. Oh All right, so how does water support the life? Well, you need to know water is cohesive. Water sticks to itself, which is actually really important. Water can moderate temperatures. Water is, uh, we call that in chemistry a high specific heat, but it moderates the temperature around it. You know this. That's why you put ice cubes in your water, so it's cool. We'll get to it. Another reason why water supports life is because ice floats. If ice didn't float, there would be no life in the water. Think about it. If ice was solid and fell to the bottom of the lake, would any of the fish survive? No, they'd all be dead. So literally the reason why ice float is actually important for life. And then the versatility of water as a solvent. You know this because water dissolves things, right? Lots of things. And that's actually important. Because water dissolves things is the reason why those salts can get inside of your body, which is why Gatorade helps you, right? Yes, that's why you're replenishing it. All right, uh, the lack of electrolytes make you crap. All right, so the water has a negative side and a positive side. So it's kind of like little magnets and they can attract each other. This is called polarity, polar, polar ends, right? A positive end and a negative end. And the reason why is because oxygen kind of steals all the electrons. 
It's kind of like an electron hog. He doesn't like to play well with others. And so what happens is all the negative electrons wind up being stuck around oxygen because they're like hoarding and hoarding and hoarding. And then the poor little hydrogens have nothing left. No, it winds up being slightly positive on the hydrogen ends because they have a lack of electrons. And then slightly negative on the oxygen end because he always has a surplus of electrons. And this leads to the reason why water does everything. Water is polar. Water is very polar. Oxygen is one of the most electronegative, means it's one of the biggest electron hogs there is. And hydrogen is one of the most electropositive, meaning it does not hold on to that electron hardly at all. So you have the largest polar difference between the top of the molecule and the bottom of the molecule. So what you wind up having is all the water, every single atom of water, every single molecule kind of acts like a little baby magnet. Magnets, if I threw a whole bunch of magnets in a bag, what would happen to them all? They would all go together, wouldn't they? And they would arrange themselves positive, negative, positive, negative, don't they? Does anything make it do that? No, it just does it, right? And that's what happens to water. That's why water is liquid. That's why water is puddles. You ever seen it on your car? How when you're driving through mist, it'll go together, won't it? It'll make bigger clumps and bigger clumps until they get so heavy they roll off. It clumps like that. Water sticks together. That's cohesiveness, and it's all because of this polarity. This is also the reason why water has such a high specific heat, because it's really hard to break those. They make little bonds in between each one, little, little tiny bonds called hydrogen bonding. It's the reason why that water has a very high boiling point. Water has a very low cooling off point. This is the reason why water is so well suited for life. All right, so these hydrogen bonds, these little bonds that happen between the positive section and the negative section of the next one, they're not a real bond. They're not like a full strength covalent bond, but they're close. You can rip magnets apart, right? But sometimes they're really hard to rip apart, but you can still rip them apart. That's kind of like the idea that I like to tell people about hydrogen bonds. It's similar to that. Yes, you can take them apart, but when I let them go, what are they gonna do? Go right back together again. That's these hydrogen bonding. That is why water is cohesive. That is why water sticks together, why water is really hard to, um, to boil. The hydrogen bonding and the polarity of water explain why water is the basis of life. Water's unique. All right, one H2O can form four separate bonds with the stuff around it. So it winds up being this crystalline structure when it is in ice. That's why it spreads out. That's why it gets gas pockets. That's why it can float. Again, the reason why water is basis of life. All right, so when water freezes, it makes these little lattices here. So they make these little hydrogen bonds and they wind up bonding all around them. And you wind up having space in between the molecules. It's kind of like if we all said, let's everybody hold hands. Well, you're gonna have to hold them at an arm's width away. The bond is the arm. So they're all gonna be spread out, aren't they? If we didn't have any bonds, we would be able to pack tighter, wouldn't we? So the tightness is the density. So ice can't do that, which is a good thing, because if it could, it would sink. So what makes ice float is the spacing of the bonds. The further apart they are, the more space they have, the less dense they are, which means density is, in, is how tightly packed those molecules are. And they're not very tightly packed, so it can float which is important. Ice floats because of the bonding. Mm -hmm. No. All right, capillary action. You ever sucked on a straw? Mm -hmm. Then you understand capillary action. When I take my mouth off the straw, isn't there water higher in the straw than it is in the cup? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's called capillary action. The reason why it has capillary action 
is because water, we said, sticks to itself, doesn't it? But it also, because it's polar, because it's a little magnet, it can stick to other stuff too. So not only is it sticking to itself, which is holding it together as a liquid, but it's also sticking to the sides of the straw. So it's kind of clinging. So you see here on these, how they're always in a circle. You ever seen how in the straw, it's actually not straight, it's curved. That's because water's holding on to the sides of the container. Cohesion is its attachment to itself. Adhesion is its attachment to something else, like adhesive tape, because tape is sticking to something other than tape. Cohesive bandage, if you're like a football guy, you know what I'm talking about, but it sticks only to itself. So water, this capillary action is super important because this is what allows water to drain to our aquifer. Do you know what the aquifer is? You should, you live in Florida. What's the aquifer? It's a water purifier, but natural, right? So our water naturally percolates down through the soil. How does it do that? Capillary action. Our well pumps it up from the bottom, right? So that well stays water in it all the time because of capillary action. All right, so pH is the measure of how acidic something is or how basic. Um, bases, every once in a while, you'll hear them called alkaline. It's the same thing. It's AKA, it's the same thing. If I say alkaline, I'm talking about base. Acid or acidic are the same one as well. All right, so you have acids are low or high pH. Who remembers sixth grade? It's a long time ago. I know, it's been a while. You've seen the pH scale, right? Okay. So acids are low numbers. So from 6.9 down to zero is considered an acid. Seven is what? What's seven? Neutral, right? Completely neutral. And then anything above seven to 14, so like 7.1 to 14 is considered what? Alkaline or a base, right? Same thing. So you need to remember how that um, pH works. So an acid adds hydrogen to the water, which is why that carbonic acid makes the water more hydrogenated, which is why it's an acid. A base takes hydrogens away. And that's important because if we're making the ocean more acidic, it's doing the opposite function. And I want you to think about the biochemistry of all of these animals. They're made to have water or um, hydrogen leaving the water, not being added to, because it changes the chemistry of the water, which changes all of the biochemical reactions, which means some of them may or may not be able to do any of the reactions that require them to be living. All right, so in a neutral situation, they're even. Hydrogen is even. It's evenly going in and out. That's what makes it neutral. It's neither. So you remember the pH scale, right? Zero is super acid. 14 is super base. Which is worse, is acid or base? Neither. They're both just as bad. They're just opposites of one another. They're just as bad. In fact, I like to tell kids the bases are worse because nobody says a base and everybody gets scared. Everybody says strong acid and they say, ooh, I know what that means, right? Because it bubbles and fizzes and gives all this stuff. But a strong base can burn you worse because you won't even know what's happening. So what happens is when you get to an acid, it starts to smell and you get real slimy because it's dissolving your skin. In a base, it doesn't smell, it doesn't steam until it gets so far down that it's actually hit the pain receptors in your skin, which are in the third layer. You Well, it, if it's on your finger, you're not gonna die. 
I mean, it's not that strong. You're going to scream long before it. You'll wash it off before that. But I mean, yes, it can if you just sit there in a vat of acid, which you're not going to do. Okay. All right, but low pHs are called acids. High pHs are called bases. So acids, bases, neutral, right? If an ocean is supposed to be about 8.2, what is it, acid or base? 8.2. Base. Seven is neutral. So it should be a slightly, not very, but slightly basic because it's not pure water, is it? It's on your screen. Pure water is seven. Seawater should be in the eight ranges because there's stuff dissolved in it, right? Salt, minerals, all kinds of other junk in it. And that changes the pH, sir. And then when you have pure water, that's water with absolutely nothing in it. So rainwater is not pure either. It's got stuff in it too. You ever uh, watched the like dripping water faucet and just left it for a while? When we're here, it gets that white crusty stuff, doesn't it? It has calcium, it has things dissolved in it, especially here where we have hard water. That's why you get the nasty rings around your tub and stuff like that. All right, but bases have a high pH. You've all dealt with bases, you just didn't realize it. Bathroom cleaner is a strong base, not acid. The bases are used as bathroom cleaners because they're actually, um, they don't smoke and give off fumes. They're, they still do the same thing. They just don't give off fumes like an acid would. So your really strong uh, bathroom cleaner is basic most of the time. All right, so when this ocean, now that you know a little bit about chemistry of the water, I can explain to you how this ocean works. All right, so the ocean absorbs that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And what happens is it converts that to carbonic acid. All right, so we are the reason why there's excess carbonic, um, I'm sorry, excess carbonic acid in the water because we put all this excess carbon dioxide in our air. It's not designed to have this much carbon dioxide and be balanced. We've oh, set the balance. So too much carbon dioxide um, can harm these marine organisms because of its, it cannot produce calcification. Calcification is what makes the bones hard. It's what makes the shells a shell. They won't have hard shells. They'll have soft, brittle shells. And then what's going to happen if they have a soft shell? Is it going to offer them any protection from predators? No. They will die faster. Can they have babies if you can't produce the shell or the... Um, or your shell that you're producing on a baby is super thin and translucent. Mm -mm. So we're kind of killing them in multiple ways here. All right, so how does this happen? So we're going to break this little reaction down. Carbon dioxide from the atmosphere plus the water gives me the carbonic acid, H2CO3. It literally takes the H2 and puts it all together. You see where the two hydrogens come from? See where the three oxygens come from? You see the carbon? They all go together. They just come together. Nothing makes it do that. It just does that. So you wind up with this carbonic acid. In the water, it breaks down into these hydrogen ions, which make it more acidic, right? The more hydrogen ions we have, the more acidic our water is. And it has this other ion, which is bicarbonate. All right, so this bicarbonate causes some of the issues. All right, so the hydrogen ions and any carbonate ions form this bicarbonate. It makes it more difficult for the organisms to obtain carbon. If it's stuck in a bicarbonate, they can't use it. So if they can't use it, they can't make their shells. All right, so all shells are not the same. We have two different types of shells. You don't have to know these, but what happens is the density of these shells dif differs. So if you have a calcite-based shell, which is like our coral, it's about 10 grams of it. 
If you decrease the pH, it drops to about eight grams. So what happens is you've decreased the density. And then if you have argonite, which is similar to the um, shells of like, um, you know, the conchs with the twisty shells and the pretty shells like those, the typical shells that you're thinking of, they're about 10 grams and they'll drop all the way down to five. Those shells are more sensitive to bicarbonate ions. And so this is what happened. They took this study. This is a picture of an actual um, foraminiferin. So this foraminiferin is a type of small zoology or um, zooplankton, little tiny little zooplankton. This is what he's supposed to look like. And what happened is this is after 20 something days in a slightly acidic chamber. What happened to the shell? Mm -hmm. it, it broke down, didn't it? Mm -hmm. So is this organism shell, is it gonna still protect him? Mm -hmm. No. So he's gonna die of, I mean, he could die from anything, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very weak shells. All right, so existing hard parts are dissolving and those hard parts that they're trying to make, they can't even make because they can't even get the uh, carbonate or the carbon that they need to make them. So what happens is you have all of these fisheries that we like to eat that will co that are having a massive amount of problems because of ocean acidification. It's about four billion U.S. dollars, and that's just U.S. dollars a year is having an issue. Mollusks, shellfish. So we eat a lot of shellfish. You should. It's good. <laughs> All right, crustaceans. Y'all like lobster, crab, shrimp, things like that. Um, you have calcifiers, predators. They're actually getting bigger. Um, oysters, mussels, scallops, clam, crab, lobster, shrimp, all kinds of fun stuff that we all like, right? Mm -hmm. All that is going to be an impacted by ocean acidification. They are already feeling the impacts of ocean acidification, not just here, everywhere on the planet. Not right now. Mm -hmm. All right, so about four groups of an animals are the most fish. And these are the calcifiers. These are any animal that makes, uses, or has a shell, right? Some sort of shell, some sort of exoskeleton, anything like crabs, shrimp, because they have those exoskeletons. They're all made out of the same material. The other ones are ones that prey on them. Because if these calcifiers do go downhill, so do their predators, right? So all of the things that eat them. Who's a predator of them? Sure. We are. We eat them. Okay? Mollusks are the most vulnerable. Mollusks are the shelled ones. So things like clams and stuff that you eat. Crabs are um, a little different, but they are part of the calcifiers. All right, so these are individual organisms. What happens is not only are they dissolving, not only can they not get enough calcium to grow, but now they can't even reproduce. So if you look over here, this is spawning coral. So corals spawn, you learned that last class, where they just produce the uh, sperm and they just kind of let it go. Then they produce the eggs and just kind of let them go. And in the water, Hopefully, somebody's going to meet somebody, and we have a new baby coral. It doesn't matter. All right, but what happens when these ocean is very acidificate, it's got a lot more acid in it, you wind up not getting fertilized. So not only can they dissolve them, they now can't even reproduce. And they can't even make the shells if they did reproduce. So they're gonna die off much faster than expected. So you wind up having like this huge issue with making it more acidic. The fish have hearing bones in their ears. And what happens is this is how they um, get away from predators. They looked at hearing bones of clownfish, you know, Nemo. 
They looked at the bones of these clownfish and they noticed that these clownfish hearing bones are getting dissolved because of the acidification of the ocean. So they're becoming deformed, which means they're getting ate quicker. So they're also dying off. So it's a lower survival rate just due to ocean acidification that they have no claim over at all. All right, these tropical oceans, what's going to happen? Corals are going to become more and more rare. And I would love to tell you that, you know, this is not far off, but it's really, really close together. This is going to happen within the next decade. What this reef looked like in 2007, what this reef looked like in uh, four years later, and then four years after that. Yeah, same exact reef. All right, so corals are going to become more and more rare. Algae, that nasty algae sludge is going to become more and more abundant. And then because coral reefs support all the life, all the life is going to leave. Look, lots of life, very little, none. And that's what's happening all around the world. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so what can we do about it? Well, a lot of scientists around the world have been studying this problem. In fact, we don't know the answer completely because there is no good answer, but we have a couple of ideas. One of the first ideas that they, they thought about, what if we add all that calcium carbonate back to the ocean? We use it. It's called limestone. Half of our roads in Madison County are limestone. That white dirt road crap, that dusty that's limestone, that will lower, uh, that will increase the pH. What's the problem with that though? Can you imagine how much limestone we'd have to put back in the ocean to raise the pH? The ocean guys, oceans, like 70% of the earth. There's no possible way. Yes, we've been pumping it out for years and years and years and years to use it, but to be honest, what we've pumped out is a drop in the bucket compared to what we would need to put it back the way that it needed to be. There's no possible way. So to counter out two gigatons of carbon per year input, because that's what we're putting in now, because you love to use your lights and you like to drive your cars and you like to do all that stuff, two gigatons offset. All right, we would need 20 gigatons of calcium carbonate per year put back in there. There's, there's no possible way, no possible way. Um, these are the limestone mines. It would take that much every year. Not gonna happen. And plus, how would we move that? Even if we could, how, much, how would we move all that massive rock into the ocean? We'd have to use all kinds of diesel trucks, which are putting more carbon dioxide into the air. So it's like six one way, half a dozen the other. It doesn't matter. You're still going to kill it. Iron. All right. So one of the scientists said, well, what about iron fertilization? So if we put iron into the ocean, it would attach to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It removes carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but it's also going to destroy the phytoplankton. Remember we said that the phytoplankton were the plankton that are green. And so if there's more of those in the world that produce all of our oxygen. So if we put all of this iron into the air, like we're talking about, um, wouldn't that kill us? Yeah, probably not a good idea either. All right, so what uh, the foraminifera um, would die off and sink to the bottom. And then again, we're just going to kill ourselves. So it's not going to help any. All right, so the biggest one, just stop adding carbon dioxide to the air. But that's easier said than done, isn't it? Because everybody likes to use computers. Everybody likes to use phones. Everybody has stuff plugged in. Everybody has the lights turned on. Everybody on this entire planet, all nine trillion of us, use energy. That's the problem. 
What are you going to tell us to stop? Yeah. Have you ever been in a blackout? People freak the freak out. You're not going to do that. Nobody's going to do that. So what's our, what are we going to do? What are we left with? What can we do? Can we save the coral reef? Can we stop this from happening? Yeah. That's why I told you it's not going to happen. Because we're not going to do that. 